If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 1. The theme that I have been given tonight is opposed by enemies. Tripp talked about the opposition of sin this afternoon. My theme is opposed by enemies, but God redeems us from all our foes. In this way, he is undefeated. Exodus is Moses' sequel to the epic story of Genesis. Indeed, Exodus picks up where Genesis left off. Israel is in Egypt, and it not only proceeds to tell the story of God's deliverance of Israel from oppression and slavery, but to reveal for believers of all time what it means to be redeemed by God. Now, as you know, Exodus 1 begins with Israel in trials and bondage. And of course, that is remarked upon in the very end of the book of Genesis. What's the last conversation between Jacob and his brothers in Genesis? It's, it's over the evil that they have done in selling him into slavery. And they fear now that his father Jacob has passed on that he will his opportunity to have his revenge against them. And he says to them in Genesis 50, 20, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now think how significant that is. He is sold into slavery, but he has a profound knowledge of God's overarching sovereignty and providence in his life. God has a purpose. Think how important that would have been for Israel's slaves in Egypt for 400 years to realize. God's sovereign providence over their lives. Indeed, it's because of that trust in providence that Joseph showed a lack of bitterness to his plight God has a purpose for Joseph's suffering. And just as God provided in the dark providences of Joseph, so he would for his people in Egypt, and so he will today. A couple of final preparatory thoughts before we read God's Word together. First of all, remember that Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 16, says that the Exodus story was written for us and happened for us. It's for us. Second, don't forget the conversation between Jesus and Elijah and Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember what they were talking about? Luke tells us in Luke 9.31 that they were talking about the exodus that Jesus was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. This story of deliverance is our story of deliverance. That's why Cornelius van der Waal says, exodus is not an account of the history of some foreign nation in which we have some passing interest. The ultimate issue is our deliverance from the house of bondage and our covenant with the Lord. This story is about our people. By grace, we have been grafted in to this story of salvation if we are resting and trusting in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. So this story is about our people. When I was a little boy, my father would take me to family graveyards in the countryside and he would say, son, he would push away the, the overgrowth and point me to a tomb, and he would say, son, these are your people. Well, God's showing you your people. These are your people. You've been grafted in, and their story is your story. So let's hear God's word from Exodus chapter 1. Before we read, let's pray and ask for God's help and blessing. Heavenly Father, we do not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Speak, Lord, your servants listen. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This is the word of God, hear it, beginning in Exodus 1, verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. 
Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Amen. And thus ends this reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write its eternal truth upon all our hearts. What's this passage about? Let me try and summarize it for you in a couple of sentences. God redeems and grows his people even through pain and suffering. And even under the opposition and the oppression of our enemies. God's plan of salvation is sovereign. It cannot be thwarted by any enemy's oppositions, any trial or tribulation, any persecution. God's plan of redemption is all of grace in all ages, and his purposes of salvation and sanctification will be undefeated no matter what. Let me draw your attention to five things in particular in this passage. I have five points, not those five points, these five points. The people of God, the plan of God, the purposes of God, the promise of God, and the power of God. Let's begin with the people of God. Draw your attention especially to verse one. Uh, where the uh, names of the sons of Israel uh, are introduced. 
These are the names of the sons of Israel. One of the things that's being emphasized here is that God is making a little family into a great, a great people for himself. When you read the phrase, these are the names of the sons of Israel, that is the last time in the Pentateuch the last time in the five books of Moses, the last time in the Torah that the phrase sons of Israel refers to Jacob's immediate family. From now on, that phrase will mean the whole people of God because God is taking a family and making a nation out of it. Just as we are called to call a people to God from every tribe, tongue, and nation, men and women and boys and girls. God is making a people for himself. And we see that even in Exodus chapter one. He's taking this little family of Jacob and their 70 family members, and he is going to make it into a great nation. God is making a people for himself. That's the first thing that I want you to see. The second thing is this. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 links God's purposes in the Exodus to his creation ordinances mentioned in Genesis 1 to Adam, to his words of blessing to Noah in Genesis 9, to his words to Abraham in Genesis 12. In other words, the second thing I want you to see is that the plan of God does not change. God has one plan of salvation. It's the same in all ages, one gracious redeeming purpose from all time. The redemption and promises of Abraham are linked to Exodus chapter one, verse seven, the redemption and covenant with Noah are linked to Exodus chapter one, verse seven, how so? Look at the language. The sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied. Does that sound familiar? The very first blessing pronounced by God to Adam was be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter one. And that promise did not go away. That ordinance, that mandate did not go away after the fall because it's repeated to Noah in Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and said, be fruitful and multiply. And of course, to Abraham, Abraham's name is changed from mighty father to father of multitudes. And he is told that nations will come from him and that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. God's plan of salvation is the same in all ages. Exodus 1-7 links God's purposes in the Exodus to God's creation ordinances, to his promises to Noah and to Abraham. God grows his people according to his word. And this reminds us that the requirements and the blessings of the creation order are still part of God's plan of redemption. This passage shows us the unity of the salvation plan of God. Third, look at what this passage says about the purposes of God. Both God's purposes towards his enemies and his purposes in our suffering. This passage makes it clear that God has a purpose for his enemies. God uses even his and our enemies even when they don't know it. Notice what we're told in verse eight. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph and he said to his people, behold, The people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them. Hold on, do you you remember that language, come, let us? Remember the last time we saw that language? 
It's from the Tower of Babel. Come, let us build a tower into the heavens. How did that work out? And here is Pharaoh. Again, he doesn't even know what he's doing. He is in opposition to the rule of God. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. And by the way, that language of shrewdly, does that remind you of anything? We're told in Genesis 3 that the serpent was craftier or shrewder than any animal or beast of the field. Pharaoh doesn't realize it, but he is advancing the purposes of Satan. He has picked a fight with God that he did not even know that he was picking. He thought he was picking a fight with the people of Israel, but what he was really doing was picking a fight with God. It's important for us to remember that. We will bear witness to people who have no idea that they have picked a fight with God. I was sharing the gospel with a person on one occasion and said, um, he politely listened to me uh, share the gospel, and then he said, thank you so much for, for sharing that, but I don't need that. You see, I'm a good person, and I'll be okay. The, the implication was this, I don't need Jesus, I don't need the death of Jesus on my behalf, I'm a good person, I'll be okay. You see, you may have heard that too from someone. That person doesn't know that they've picked a fight with God. That They've just said, God, the death of your son was not necessary, at least not necessary for me. There's another way for me to be accepted by you. I don't need Jesus. There are all sorts of people who who have no idea that they picked a fight with God. And our responsibility is to share the gospel with those folks. Pharaoh has no idea that he has picked a fight with God. But there's another thing I want you to see about God's purposes here, and this is a harder thing for us. Look at especially at verses 11 to 14. Because this passage makes it clear that God has a plan for our suffering. God has a purpose for his people's suffering even when we do not see it. Look at what we're told about the first phase of Pharaoh's plan to keep the children of Israel under control. Verse 11, they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. They built for Pharaoh storage cities The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor. All the labors which they rigorously imposed on them, so taskmasters and burdens and affliction and hard labor and slavery and bitterness and rigorous labor. All of these things are part of Pharaoh's design to suppress the children of Israel and their growth. Now, of course, this had been prophesied in Genesis chapter 15. If you look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, God had promised Abraham that the children of Israel would be afflicted for 400 years and enslaved, but then that they would be brought out. In other words, That was part of the purposes of God. And of course, the story of Jacob had made it, uh, the story of Joseph had made it clear that Joseph's sufferings were part of the plan of God. There's several things I want you to note here. Number one, the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. Verses 43, 46, and 53 will use this story to say to believers, don't treat your servants the way you were treated by the Egyptians. It will draw that lesson for us. Don't you treat people the way that you were treated in Egypt. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't treat people the way that you were treated 
in Egypt. Another irony that we see here is that Pharaoh attempts to make the children of Israel's life hard. God's intention is to make Pharaoh's life hard. There's one last thing that's more important than all of these. If you thought, how is it that God in the end relieves Israel of the burden of these afflictions? Yes, he triumphed gloriously over the army of Pharaoh at the Red Sea, but what was it that brought Israel out of Egypt? The blood of the Passover lamb. That's how God alleviated Israel's affliction, the blood of the Passover lamb. And John, of course, will say when he sees Jesus coming, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And the Apostle Paul will say, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. And what did the Lamb of God, Christ our Passover, do that we might be brought out of oppression and affliction? Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 53. And we read this. He was oppressed and he was afflicted and yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, though He had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. It shouldn't surprise us, should it, that God has a purpose in our sufferings if God had a purpose in Christ's sufferings. I mean, we serve a crucified Savior, right? And so we shouldn't be surprised when we learn in the Scriptures that God has a purpose in our sufferings. Peter, in the book of Acts, in his great sermon in Acts chapter 2, will say, this man delivered up by the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of sinful men. The, the, the point being, it was appointed by the Father's plan and purpose for the Son to go to the cross. That's how our oppression was lifted. That's how our iniquities were forgiven. So it should not surprise us that the Lord has a purpose for our afflictions. Just over 10 years ago, a 17-year-old girl was killed in an automobile accident here in Louisville. Her name was Brittany Bevan. And the night before she died, she wrote this prayer in her journal. As a new week approaches, my dangerous prayer is that you will place the brokenhearted people in my path and fill me with you so that I can let your love heal their pain. The next day she died in an automobile accident. And her parents established the Bevan Center at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary for the advancement of the gospel amongst the nation and the nations in her honor. You really ought to read from her diary. It's, I, I have it in the front of the little prayer folder that I use every year. It's a 17-year-old girl teaching me how to be a Christian. We we shouldn't be surprised when there's pain and suffering and affliction and even death in the Christian life. God has a purpose for that. About the same time, uh, I was told a story uh, in California of a 
17 or 18 year old young woman who had been converted to Christ in a closed Muslim country and uh, her uncle had attempted to kill her because of her conversion to Christ. And when she came back to the United States to study at Masters University, uh, some of the folks who work in the university halls heard her story and they said, boy, Dr. John MacArthur really needs to hear this story. And they, they brought her to John MacArthur to, to tell this amazing story. And uh, he asked her, what were you thinking when your uncle was about to kill you. This is a 17 or 18 year old young woman and she says this, I was thinking this man has a religion that he would kill for, but I have a savior that I would die for. And I, I thought to myself, there's a 17 or 18 year old young woman who understands what it means to be a Christian in ways that I don't. don't. Don't think that if you commit yourself to serve the Lord in your local church or somewhere around the world, that he won't choose to use your sufferings for his glory. That may be precisely what he chooses to use for the spreading of the gospel. God has purposes in our sufferings. The fourth thing I want you to see, though, is the promise of God. Look at verse 12. The more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied. God's promises continued to be fulfilled despite the oppression of Israel's enemies. God's promise, you see, is more powerful than our enemies. God's promises are more powerful than Pharaoh's plan. I love what Matthew Henry says about this. The policies of the church's enemies aim to defeat the promises of the church's God. But in vain, God's counsels shall stand. That's why this conference is named Undefeated. His purposes are undefeated. His purposes will not be defeated by the policies of the church's enemies. That's why Tertullian could say the blood of the martyr is seed and could say the more pressed we are, the more the church grows. And it's why Matthew Henry could say hell and earth cannot diminish those whom heaven will increase. The promises of God will stand. One last thing, the power of God. Three things about the power of God I want you to see in this passage. Look first at verses 15 and 16. Here we see the humbling power of God, and it's displayed in relation to Pharaoh. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. Just think of this. The, the king of Egypt had given a command to the Hebrew midwives that requires for him to engage with them, to talk with them. Here we have the king of Egypt reduced to a conversation with lowly midwives in order to accomplish his plan, but they do not listen to him. Secondly, notice that Pharaoh is never named but the midwives are named. The names of the righteous are eternal, but the names of the wicked are forgotten. The power, the humbling power of God is displayed in this story with Pharaoh. Then look at verses 17 to 19. Here we see the power of God displayed through the seemingly powerless, the powerless. God shows his sovereignty by using these seemingly powerless women to foil the plans of the one who was considered to be a god in Egypt. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them. By the way, it's a reverse of Genesis 3. Eve does not listen to the word of God. She listens to the word of the serpent. The Hebrew midwives listen to the word of God, not to the word of the king of Egypt. And so we see the power of God displayed through these 
Hebrew midwives. They thwart the purposes of Pharaoh. God shows his power by using the seemingly weak to conquer the seemingly strong. And then look at verses 20 to 22. We here see the power of God in judgment, both for blessing and for cursing. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty because the midwives feared God. He established households for them. God blessed his people according to his word. And because the Hebrew midwives feared him, and that's one of the great Old Testament words for true religion, true relationship with God, to fear God. It's not, it's not uh, I'm scared of God, it's I'm in awe of God. I revere God. We, we revere him as Lord and we love him as Father. That's what it means to fear God in the Old Testament. And these midwives feared God, and the power of God in judgment blessed them. Remember what he had said to Abraham? I will bless you. I will surely bless you. And those that God blesses will not be unblessed. But there's also the power of God's judgment in cursing here, isn't it? Look at verse 22. It ought to give you a shiver down your back when you read these words. Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The doom that Pharaoh had appointed to the male children of Israel will end up being the doom of the army of Egypt. They will be drowned in the Red Sea. He had written, he had written and sealed his own fate. Now in this passage, we see that God redeems and grows his people even through pain and suffering, even under the opposition and the oppression of his enemies. God's plan of salvation is sovereign. It cannot be thwarted by any enemy's opposition, any trial or tribulation, any persecution. God's plan of redemption is all of grace in all ages to all of his people and his purposes of salvation and sanctification will be undefeated no matter what. That confidence in God's power, in his purposes, in his promise and his plan ought to be comforting to his people as we seek to go to the nations and call the nations to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would work its truth deep into our hearts. We ask, oh God, that we would truly trust your power and sovereignty and goodness that we would trust you even and especially in our own trials, that we would truly believe that there is nothing, no opposition that can thwart your plans and purposes, and that neither death nor life can keep us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.